And if you don't call me and let me know, I'll be calling you and say, please. <laughs> All right. You know, we are especially lucky tonight to have Dr. Tenkati return to us. He's been such a marvelous speaker uh, to us on a number of occasions, and uh, we've been proud to have him here. And um, I just wanted to tell you a few things about him. He's the professor of history and director of the Center for Public History at NKU. He's a frequent speaker on regional topics and has co-edited, along with co colleagues, three recent books, including The Gateway City, Covington, 1815 to 2015, the 250-page Cincinnati, the Queen City, and that was published by the Cincinnati Museum Center, and then the 1,048-page, this is the crowning glory, <laughs> Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky, which I have on my shelf at home. I'm just so happy with that. Love to read through that. He's edited and authored so many hundreds, really, of newspaper and journal, journal articles. He's been a consultant to more than a dozen public TV documentaries, including the one that we're always familiar with, regional Emmy Award winning Where the River Bends, A History of Northern Kentucky. And also, he um, produced Sacred Spaces of Greater Cincinnati back in 2008. So now, he's come to tell us about our German heritage. And most, most folks in Boone County, and Northern Kentucky, I should say, have somebody back there in that German-speaking bunch. And so, let's all welcome Dr. Paul Tenkati. Can everyone hear me? All right, let's get started. And by the way, I have my latest book, which is on Mother of God Church, 175 years old, we'll be talking about it this evening. John's holding it up back there. My two colleagues from NKU, John Schlipp, from, they're both from the library, Phil Yanarella, uh, back in the back. I told them it's for sale at $20. It's slightly discounted from $22. And I, and I asked them to please not leave until they sell all, all of the comments. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, this is entitled More Than Beer, Brats, and Polka. Because I think one of the first things you think of nowadays when you think of Germans are, are kind of those three things. And no, Phil, I did not. He asked if I had posed for this little <laughs> I could have, but I didn't. <laughs> Why do I call this more than beer, brats, and polka? I must have some, some kind of theme in mind, and hopefully we'll get to that pretty soon. You know, the great uh, thinker, theologian, and one of the most important people in European history, in fact, we will be celebrating in, 15, in 2017 the 500th anniversary right, in October of 2017, of Martin Luther attacking his 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg Church. So it's appropriate that we start with this quote. He said, Germany is a beautiful, strong horse with food and everything she needs, but she lacks a rider. What did he mean by that? <clears throat> well, this shows the Holy Roman Empire, which today we would call Germany, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, the Netherlands, and a few other things. And the Holy Roman Empire was really, the heart of that was what we now refer to as Germany. Now, Martin Luther, in his founding of, and he never really intended to, to establish a new religion, but he, he founded one, the Lutheran religion, named after him. And after that, uh, some fighting got underway, some religious warfare in the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire had as its emperor an elected emperor, but only seven people elected the emperor. They were the seven most important people in Germany, the seven largest landowners. And from the 1400s on, 
they had typically mostly elected the Habsburg family of Europe. Has anybody heard of the Habsburg family? Well, let me tell you something a little bit about the Habsburg family. The Habsburg family was the wealthiest family in Europe at the time. In fact, Charles V in the 1500s pretty well inherited all of the following. Spain, Portugal, later on they had add Portugal to it, all of the Spanish New World possessions in the Americas. Imagine what that would have been, mainly most of South America and Central America, and even part of North America. Uh, the Netherlands, parts of Italy, uh, what we now call Germany, uh, Austria, and Hungary, and Bohemia, etc., and etc. And here he was, and he was elected emperor, but at the end of one of the big wars of religion called the Thirty Years' War, which was over in 1648 and settled by the Peace of Westphalia, this is what Germany looked like. In fact, we can't even get enough resolution in this map to show you that there were over 300 principalities, duchies, kingdoms, bishoprics, archbishoprics, etc. 300 separately governing uh, areas of Germany. And over it all was the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, <clears throat> who handled kind of the foreign policy. And that's about all he handled. Everything else was pretty autonomous. But at the end of this war, it was already the beginning of the end of the Holy Roman Empire, which that real wag and intellectual Voltaire, you heard of Voltaire, he said that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. And on all accounts, he was pretty well right. The religious significance of the Thirty Years' War and the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 were only three religions were acceptable. Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism, also referred to as evangelical, and Reformed Calvinism. And I promised Steve Conrad to say a good word for the Calvinists, for the Reformed. <laughs> they, they became in other areas like Scotland, the Presbyterians, okay? And they were predestinarian at one time. <clears throat> So these were the only three religions you were allowed to be. Now, Napoleon gets this bright idea to go ahead and march throughout Europe and try to promote the French way of life, right? And he ends up being pretty successful. By 1806, he had conquered the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire died in 1806, even though the Habsburgs continued on in Austria and in Hungary and so forth. And so the Holy Roman Empire was ended. Napoleon created the Confederation of the Rhine. And then if he just had kind of left it alone and not decided to attack Russia, maybe we would still be, maybe we would be speaking French today, who knows. But anyhow, he went ahead and attacked Russia. Bad idea, always a bad idea. And uh, the Congress of Vienna, the German Confederation was established and it included 77 different divisions. So it's getting a little better, you know, from 300 plus, now it's only down to 77 in 1850. Then it takes Bismarck from Prussia, the so-called Iron Chancellor, to by the, at the end of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71, uh, he declares the German Empire. Now, the first German Empire was the Holy Roman. It was called the First Reich. The second German Empire was Bismarck's, and it was Prussia. That was the Second Reich. Uh, what was the Third Reich? You all know, right? <laughs> Hitler's Germany, okay. So if you ever looked up your ancestors, and they, you looked at the census for 1850 or 1860, what did you find? You really didn't find Germany, did you? You found Prussia, or Baden, Württemberg, Bavaria, Oldenburg, all of these separate divisions, Westphalia, etc. So um, that's because Germany was not really united until 1871. 
And then it tried to make up for lost time. Now, what do we know about Prussia and religion? Because religion <clears throat> was terribly important in most of the centuries before the 20th century. And that's not to discount it now. It just, it's not generally seen in most democracies and most civilizations today as part and parcel because we, se we celebrate the division, the separation of church and state so we can, you know, worship the way we want to. So it's hard for us to imagine that Prussia was very good in welcoming those Calvinists, those Huguenots, after their expulsion from France in 1685 when Louis XIV had enough of them. In 1817, however, they forced the union of the Lutheran, that is the Evangelical, and the Reform, that is the Calvinist churches. Now that wasn't a terribly popular move among many people in Prussia at all. <clears throat> and then under Otto von Bismarck, they persecuted Catholics during the so-called culture war, the Kulturkampf of 1871 to 79 of Otto von Bismarck. Keep all these things in mind because they're leading up to the big thing of immigration historians and that is why do people uproot themselves and leave their homelands and leave their families and go someplace else? You know, Elon Musk, you all know Elon Musk, you've heard of him, he's that really intelligent man who's a <laughs> billionaire and my, uh, my dear cousin works for his, uh, what is it, SpaceX or something now, and he's coming up, he's going to have this spaceship to Mars, right? Now, you can all sign up for that if you like. I'm certain there's a process. If you do, what do you have to realize? You're not coming back. Okay, you're going to die up there on Mars, okay? There's no spaceship coming back to get you. Uh, at least that's the plan, right? So, that seems silly, but let's think of that. What were the odds? What were the odds that anybody leaving Germany or any place else in the world was ever going to go back again? The great odds were that they were never going to go back again. And let's talk technology. If you were on a sailing ship, it could take three months, three months to get to the United States. You know, later on that's cut down to about three weeks when they have steamships. But it wasn't a pleasant experience. Most people could only afford steerage. Steerage meant below deck. Steerage meant that you couldn't see out. Well, they let you up on deck during the day, but you couldn't see out. And has anybody been on a boat? Does anybody get car sick or, 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 or motion sickness in this room? Go ahead. Don't be proud. You can, you can admit it. Um, imagine three months of that. And imagine the conditions, the living conditions on board. And imagine that a lot of people died on board and they were just thrown overboard, right? Because you can't keep dead people around in a, a sailing ship, you know, as much as you might want to. What pushed people to actually go to the point they were so badly off that they would actually want to leave their homes and families? Well, a lot of things. European warfare and military conscription. Military conscription is the draft. And there are a lot of you, if you're Germans here in this room, that are descendants of draft dodgers. But we're going to congratulate you on that because these were wars that monarchs, that kings and queens made up. And no peasant really could care less about what the elite, the aristocracy, and the monarchs wanted to do, right? They didn't care. Instead, their land was being ridden over by troops and devastated by troops, especially if some of your families were from Aslis, Lorraine, and other places along the Rhineland. They just wanted to get out of Dodge, as most of my ancestors did in that area, because there's just so much devastation and poverty and hunger that you can put up with. Inheritance laws and other social laws. Um, very often times in Germany, the peasant family had a little land, but the oldest son would get all of the land. It was called primogenitor. So what about the younger sons? Well, they had to find someplace, something else to do. 
And what about the poor women who didn't have a dowry, who couldn't afford? And don't be a bit surprised if you look in some of your charts, your genealogical charts, and all of a sudden you find some ancestor, some woman who wasn't married and had children. And it's not because, you know, well, what we think, that they were somehow loose, they, they're just too poor. They didn't have the money for a dowry. And a lot of them came to the United States hoping to find, you know, a man here to marry. Political systems that were too authoritarian. Liberal revolutions of 1848 took place all over Europe. And by liberal, the, old, the real meaning of that word was liberties. It meant people who wanted democracy. And when those democratic revolutions were put down by the leaders, especially in Germany and Austria and other places, a lot of intellectuals were very disappointed and the first wave of Germans kind of left and said, well, we need to go to the United States if we're ever to hope to find liberty. A lack of economic opportunity. Things were changing in Germany. From 1800 to 1900, the population of Europe increased, it over doubled, from 187 million people to four, over 401 million people. Now you might say, big deal, in 100 years it doubled. It doubled despite the fact that millions of people left Europe for the United States, Canada, South America, Australia, uh, Africa, Asia, and all points in between. So the population was increasing, uh, industrialization was occurring, people were dislocated and displaced. Crop failures. We all know that the poor Irish had potato famines, but did you know there were similar kinds of famines occurring throughout Germany and other parts of Europe, Europe albeit not as horrible? And then what we just referred to, religious persecution. So, those are the push factors that are pushing people out of Germany. What are the pull factors? The number one reason that most people immigrated to America was economic opportunity. That is the number one reason. They were poor people, they were peasants, and they wanted to make better for themselves and their children. Democracy. That was another reason, probably the second leading reason. But if you're a peasant and you don't know a lot other than, you know, a lot of starvation, privation, uh, democracy isn't necessarily your number one goal. Your number one goal is to feed your family. Other freedoms, religious and other freedoms, are very important too. So why did they come to this area? They came to this area because Cincinnati, Covington, Newport were part of the so-called German Triangle, the points of which were when Milwaukee, St. Louis, and then Cincinnati, Covington, Newport. Within that triangle, many of the Germans settled in the United States. So the next question becomes, why there? These were the happening cities of the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s. These were the innovative cities of the time. This is where the prosperity was. And the prosperity was here and the jobs were here. And so the first people came and then they sent back letters and then their family and friends and neighbors came and then they call that chain migration. People tend to go to the same places where their family and friends have gone before. And Cincinnati was a very prosperous place, not saying that it's not a prosperous place now, but it's not thought of as being the leading edge of, of the United States anymore, and it's no longer one of the largest cities of the United States like it once was too. So how big was Cincinnati? Cincinnati was the seventh largest city in terms of population in the United States right on the eve of the Civil War. And if you want to cheat a little, you know, look at number one and number three. You're going to say those are the, well, see, those were not merged until about 1890, 91, Brooklyn and New York. So actually, you know, some people mistakenly say it was the sixth largest city, but theoretically it was not. It was the seventh largest city, and it was growing. 
If we look at the growth of Covington and Newport, between 1840 and 1850, Covington grew 364%. That's huge. Notice, between 1850 and 60, it grew 75%. Then almost 50%, even during the decade of the Civil War in the 1860s. And notice how it begins to slow down by about the time of 1900, because all the new immigrants were starting to go to places that were more innovative and newer and had more jobs, like, you know, places like Milwaukee and Chicago and Toledo and Cleveland, all of those kind of Great Lakes cities, Buffalo and so forth. If we look at the population of Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati with the number and percentage of foreign born, in 1870, almost 29% of the population of Covington was foreign born. That does not even include their children who were born here. So you can bet your you can bet any amount of money that when you walk down the streets, and by the way, Covington didn't have as many as Newport. Newport was almost 32% foreign born. And Cincinnati, almost 37% foreign born. If you walk down the streets of Covington, Newport, or Cincinnati in 1870, you would see that there were multiple newspapers, not like today, just one newspaper, multiple newspapers, and some of those were German newspapers, and there would have been little German paper boys yelling, and you would have walked up and down the streets and heard German everywhere, everywhere you went. German immigration steadily climbed from the 1840s right on through the 1890s, and then it, became, it began to decrease, and it picked up after World War II. And we'll talk a little bit about those folks who came after World War II. Now, what do you need if you're going to be an immigrant? You need to have a, some kind of push factor to get you out, to make you want to leave. A pool to get you here, and the means. So you at least needed the money for transportation to a port city like Bremen in Germany. And then you needed to pay for steerage on a sailing ship or later a steamship. And then you needed to have your health. Now, the steamship companies, if they would accept you on board and sell you a you know, ticket, and you got to the United States, and you got to a place like Castle Garden or Ellis Island, and you were too sickly, and the doctors turned you back, then the steamship companies had to pay for you to go back to Europe. You were not allowed into the United States in those years of Ellis Island and so forth in the late 19th century unless you passed a physical examination. This is the immigrants building in, in Bremerhaven, built in 1849, so that's where a lot of your ancestors, if you have any, would have passed through. Uh, they would have arrived at the immigrant landing depot called Castle Garden on the southern tip of Manhattan if they came to New York, many of them didn't, many of them went through Baltimore and New Orleans and other places, Boston. Uh, and later on, Castle Garden was succeeded by Ellis Island, which operated from 1892 to 1943. Has anybody been to Ellis Island? Raise hands. See, quite a few of you. You want to talk about your experiences and going to Ellis Island, anyone? Wasn't it, wasn't it just something that you can't describe? It's, it's like a religious experience, it really is, to think that so many millions of immigrants pass through those halls. Now, so now we get to Boone County. The first Germans in this northern Kentucky area, large group of Germans, to come to northern Kentucky were those 1805-1806 group of Germans that formed Hopeful Lutheran Church which is the oldest Lutheran church west of the Alleghenies. And we've got Rouses and Tanners and Holidays all in this room. You can't fire a gun without hitting one of them. They're all here. And we thank them for being here. Those are the folks that started it out. But that wasn't the first place they went. They came earlier in the 1700s, right? 
and they were kind of hoodwinked on the way over. They were trying to leave Germany because they were persecuted in Germany, and then this English sea captain, God sold him tickets or something, and then he didn't, you know, he, he basically, uh, you know, left them high and dry in England. I think it was England. And then uh, they became indentured servants. They came to the United States. They came to Virginia. Is that the Germanic colony? And they, uh, yeah, and they, uh, they pretty well were indentured servants for seven years, which meant that <laughs> they paid their money, but they ended up having to serve seven years before they were free again. And then they decided at one point in time, so they go way, way back to the 1700s. It's, it's an amazing story, it really is. And then Hebron Evangelical Lutheran Church founded in 1854. And that was out of Rouse's book, right? Yeah, yeah, there it is, Michael Rouse's Images of America, Boone County. Now, if you were Lutheran or Catholic and you were coming over, you were probably praying to the Archangel Raphael, who was considered for both Lutherans and Catholics the patron saint of immigrants. And this is actually shows you Raphael, the angel, leading some immigrants to the New World. And so it's not surprising that there was formed in Germany a Sankt Raphaelsverein, St. Raphael Society, founded by a man called Peter Paul Kahensley in Germany in 1871. Peter Paul Kahensley, doesn't sound German, does it? Sounds like Irish or something. It's German, trust me. He was, his father made a great deal of money. They like sold groceries. They had a grocery store. He was, he was well off. But he really felt sorry for the Catholic German immigrants. Think of these, these are peasants. They're living in little towns. What's the neat thing about living in a little town? Anything neat about living in a little town? You know everybody's business in a little town? Which means you know who's good, who's naughty, and who's nice. And so if the naughty person comes to you and wants to sell you, you know, some land in Florida, you go, no, because I know you are not a good person. Okay, what about those peasants that left their little towns and went to Bremen and decided to buy a passage, a ticket on a steamship to the United States? Who do you think was lurking around, willing to give them a good deal <laughs> on a steamship and take their money? There were all kinds of shysters back then. They didn't invent that term later on. They didn't invent mean and nasty people in the 20th and 21st century. They've always been around. And they knew that these peasants were naive and coming from small towns and they could sell them that bridge. To prevent that, Peter Paul Kahensley founded a society of Catholic men called the St. Raphael Society. And they, they were identified by badges on their clothes and so forth. They met the immigrants and they helped the immigrants buy steamship tickets. They helped them buy, um, you know, go to the sacraments, go to mass, go to confession, etc and they got them on the steamships so that they would be safe and then they would say and when you get to new york look for a people who look like us with the badges you can trust them and then they would go and stay at a place if they needed to stay for a night or two in leo house for german catholic immigrants and it was on state street in new york leo house is still there today except they don't do immigrants they just take in groups nowadays and, and help them out. Um, Leo House was where you went and you'd spend a night or so and people would help you from the San Rafael Society buy a railroad ticket into the interior, maybe to Cincinnati. And they would make certain that you did this without getting swindled. Okay? Now, why am I talking about all this? Because the man who was the president of the German-American Priest Society in the entire United States was Reverend William Tappert, pastor of Mother God Church in Covington. He saw to the raising of the money for Leo House. He saw that it was organized, that it was opened, and Leo House no longer has records that go way back then. But I think that somewhere at Leo House, there were brochures that said, come to Mother of God Church, 
come to Covington. And there it is. Mother of God Church. 1841 founded as the first German-American Catholic parish. All the other German-American parishes in northern Kentucky were founded off of it. 1871, the present church was dedicated. Now, there were all those Calvinists running around too. Grace German Reformed Church. Almost any time you see German Reformed or Reformed Church, normally they became UCC, United Church of Christ. One was very early formed at Lockwood and Willard Street. The building still exists. It doesn't have the spire anymore. It's now a private residence. It was dedicated in 1863, and it was called the Pumpernickel Church due to the, to the member baker, John Schlutker, who was noted in, all throughout Covington for his pumpernickel bread. And he gave a lot of money to the church. Enlarged in 1896, it was closed in, in 1995, and then a lot of the congregation, not a lot, but there weren't that many left, came out to Gloria Day, Lutheran, and so forth. St. John, the first German Protestant evangelical church, 7th and Columbia Streets, built in 1859, destroyed by fire in 1939. It moved to Park and Nelson Streets and became St. John's UCC. St. Mark's Lutheran Church, 8th and Monroe Streets, founded by members of St. John's, again German. St. Paul's German Evangelical Protestant Church in Alexandria. St. Paul's Evangelical Church, 1847, this was the building, it was later on demolished, moved to Fort Wright, became UCC, and is now Disciples of Christ. And German Methodists. Most people don't realize that Germans weren't Methodists. There weren't any, I, there were very few, maybe none, maybe none. No German, we're just going to go ahead off on that limb. I'm going to go out, march out on that limb, and they're going to march out with me. There were no German Methodists until they came to the United States. And then this John Nast of Cincinnati decided that the Germans needed to become Methodists. So he sent missionaries from Cincinnati and from the United States to Germany to convert people to Methodism. Cincinnati is the home of German Methodism. Remember that next time you go into Germany. And maybe you find a Methodist church and say, I'm from the place, you owe it all to us. <laughs> Here's Emmanuel German Methodist Church. It's now on Lakeside Park, except they don't call it German anymore. Salem German Methodist Church. And uh, now Stained Glass Theater in Newport. Grace German Methodist Church on 6th Street in Newport, also closed. Yeah, I think it's a Southgate House. Is it Southgate House? Or yes. Okay. Southgate right. Revival. Okay. Um, and then you had all kinds of intellectuals like Friedrich Hacker come to Cincinnati in 1848. And he founded the Cincinnati Turnerine, the Cincinnati Turners. And the Turners believed uh, in a sound mind and a sound body. So they liked to do gymnastic exercises. They were, uh, they were very involved in, in, in being healthy. And they also liked to have all kinds of intellectual things they did as well, lectures and so forth. And they loved democracy and they loved freedom. They weren't too keen on religion. They were kind of secularists. So um, anyhow, how it's surprising how Covington and Newport and Cincinnati could have anti-German sentiments when there were so many Germans around, except those other people who weren't Germans didn't like Germans. So there was actually a know-nothing party elected to a slate of the Cincinnati Covington Council in the 1850s. It was right around 1855, 1856. And the Know Nothings were a short life party in American history called the American Party. And they got the name Know Nothing because they had some secret stuff. And you know, if you asked them anything about it, they said they knew nothing. And so uh, that's how they got their name. But they were very anti immigrant and very anti Catholic in particular. So they actually got elected to Covington City Council. And one of them, uh, you know, back in those days, policemen, police chiefs, 
they changed every time you got a new mayor and a new council. It wasn't like, you know, you didn't go for professional training as a firefighter or a policeman back then. It was a political job, a political patronage job, which is a little bit frightening because you could absolutely know nothing about any of these things and become a policeman or fireman. But anyhow, Clinton Butts, what a name, he became the city marshal. That's like the chief of police nowadays. He was a know-nothing. And so on Pentecost Monday in 1856, apparently Pentecost Sunday was such a big deal in the 19th century that everybody got a holiday on Pentecost Monday. I mean, you know, that this was pretty surprising to me. But anyhow, everybody was off and the German turners were marching out to someplace west of Covington and they had all their guns with them and, you know, they're goose stepping and they have their guns and everything and their regalia and they go out and have their little party and their beer and so forth. And then on the way back, some little little kids were throwing stones at them and they just were not real, you know, amused by that. Yeah. And But they kept marching on and Apparently, at one point in time, Clinton Bunce comes in with another officer and accuses him of something or other, and shots are fired, and Clinton gets, you know, wounded, and all of a sudden, Clinton says, it's a riot, it's a riot. And so what do you do back in 1856 when it's a riot? You, you, you tell everyone who needs to know, and they start ringing church bells. That's how you alert people. So... They're moving and they go across the bridge because there was a suspension bridge at 4th Street between Covington and Newport. They're still marching on. They're getting ready to go to the ferry landing in Newport to cross back to Cincinnati because a lot of them were from Cincinnati. And Clinton Butts and everybody is saying they need to be stopped. He doesn't have the men to do it. And he wanted the Newport Barracks, which was the major army installation out here in the West, to get involved. Now, I know we have some veterans here, so you know how this gets resolved. <clears throat> the mayor goes to the federal officer in charge of Newport Barracks and say, we need you to step in, and the officer says, no. Well, why does he say no? It's just he hasn't gotten any, right? No. Nobody higher up in D.C. or any place else has said. So that disappoints. Clinton but They finally decide to spend the night at the Newport Turner Hall and they agree to be arrested. Some of them are arrested. I think 16 or so were arrested. They each got $2,000 or so bail. That's a lot of money back then. The Germans put up the $32,000. It went to court and all of them were exonerated. And luckily, you know, they only lasted a couple years in city council and the, the know-nothings were kicked out in the next election. <coughs> now, some of those Turners crossed over from Covington and Newport and joined the 9th Regiment of the Ohio Volunteer Infantry. This was the Fighting Turners. They were a very well-known regiment. Um, they even had their women make their own regalia. They wore some very kind of Prussian-looking outfits. And uh, the Confederates were, they pretty well knew who the fighting Turners were because they were pretty visible in the regalia. And they were pretty frightened by, by these Teut Teutons, Teutonic soldiers. Uh, my great, 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 great uncle or whatever joined up with them. And I remember a Cincinnati newspaper, because they were Turners, they were in good shape, said that, you know, when they did the medical, you know, investigation of each one of you. They had to do a little medical. And back then they didn't have much to do, you know, so they pounded here and pounded there. And the newspaper said when they pounded the chest of these Turners, that it was like a blacksmith in his anvil. <laughs> so I always like to say, see how the the family has declined since that time. <laughs> There were all kinds of German-American artists in Covington. You'll find out about the first three of them in the book. Johann Schmidt, Wilhelm Lomprecht, Frank Duvenac. 
There were others like Leon Lippert and Thomas Anschutz. We don't hear much about these folks, but boy, there were a lot of German-American artists. And they put together a place like Mother of God Church, which is truly exquisite. There were German-American musicians like B.H.F. Hellbush and Edward Struble, both of which were church musicians at Mother of God Church. And Hellbush um, put together a Catholic hymnal for Germans in this country that went through 40, over 40 editions. And so some of the songs that they still sing in Catholic churches throughout the United States today were popularized by him, albeit now we sing them in German, not in German, but in, in English, like Holy God, we praise your name. Uh, oh, come little children, you know, for Christmas, since we're approaching Christmas, etc. The Germans were frugal people, and like most immigrants, tend to be frugal people, right? And put their money away, as they did at the German National Bank of Covington. This building's still there. The West German Savings Bank at 9th and Pike Street, that building's still there. It's now City of Covington Schools. This building's still there. Corner of Pike and Russell, it's an optician's office, the Germania Hall. And the Germans love their beer, like the Covington Lager Beer Brewery with Charles Geisbauer. This is uh, what that became, the John Brenner Brewing Company, which uh, is now a parking lot. It would have been down near the, uh, just right across Catacorner Corner from the Covington Public Library. The Bavarian Brewery, which is Parts of it have been bought by Kent County now and will become a new courthouse of Meyer and Riedland, also Germans. They made the Bavarian beer, and this office of the Bavarian Brewing Company is still there in Covington. Does anyone know what it is now the home of? Gleer's Ghetto. Yes, absolutely. Another German institution, Gleer's Ghetto. <laughs> And there is the Bavarian, which was closed in 66. And then there was Wiedemann, which was by far the largest of all of them, established in 1870, purchased by Heilemann in 1967, and closed in uh, 1983. Here you see the offices of the Wiedemann. And so then along comes World War I, which we're celebrating seven, uh, the centennial of this coming year. And there was a Citizens Patriotic League in this area that didn't like a lot of the Germans around here. And this is one of the papers they brought out where they say seditious Hun skunks who have preached disloyalty turn vivid yellow when visited by local Kentucky vigilantes. And this is kind of a low point in Northern Kentucky history. June of 1918 when uh, about 250 of these vigilantes of the Citizen Patriotic League gotten about 40 automobiles. And they went up and down the highway and they visited old Monsignor Henry Hans's pastor of St. John Church in Covington. It was raining, it was in the evening. They drug him out onto the porch, said that he was disloyal, when in fact his parishioners had raised all kinds of money for war bonds and had done all kinds of other wonderful things to support the war effort. They went out the 3L Highway, Madison Pike, and they found another farmer out there. And he had also bought a lot of war bonds, unbeknownst to them. But they decided to strip him naked except for his boots. And then to tie him to a fence and to horsewhip him until he, the blood was run, running down into his boots. So they took the law into their own hands. They brought some things to trial. Some people were sent to prison and later on exonerated. But the anti-German sentiment, which is also called the anti-German hysteria of World War I, led to uh, a lot of changes in the German community. And we'll summarize them here. The aftermath of World War I and its anti-Germanism. German street names were changed. So Bremen Street in Covington became Pershing Street because Pershing, you know, John, General John Pershing. German language disappeared from the public schools. Some German-American citizens anglicized their names. 
So you wouldn't even know they're German. Some libraries, including Covington's, destroyed German books. And German culture suffered an irreversible loss. This is the main reason why now we've come to the title of the lecture. More than beer, brats, and polka. This is why the history of the German Americans in this area was largely forgotten, purposely forgotten, because people didn't want any more to be associated with all of this and to be persecuted. The German National Bank, which we just showed you, changed its name to Liberty National Bank. And the German Savings Bank changed it to the Security Savings Bank. Now we come to between the wars, right? And I want you to concentrate on two areas, LARP and Gorel, Germany. I marked them with those blue places there. Germany after World War I, the Weimar Republic was created in 1919, and because of all of the negotiations at Versailles, um, hyperinflation occurred in Germany. Um, and the Germans were printing money just to make it worse, you know, because they were upset with the negotiations of World War I. In 1919, one German mark was worth $8.90. Four years later, in 1923, one mark was worth $4.2 trillion. Now, I can't make this stuff up. This is, this is true. Now, <laughs> I was taught by a lovely old nun who, who taught uh, Bruce Ferguson, Sister Mary Philip, and Thomas More. And boy, by the way, she loved Bruce Ferguson. Everybody loved Bruce Ferguson and Thomas More. So anyhow, she's just a sweet old nun. She's now deceased. And she gets to tell us the story in modern European history of how her major professor who taught her for her doctorate had lived in Vienna during this time. Okay. So he worked for the University of Vienna, and he was doing okay for himself. But he was walking to work every day, and he decided, I would like to go ahead and buy a carriage, you know, a nice carriage and, and, a, and a horse or so, right? And, okay, we'll do that. And he was the kind of person, he didn't jump at things, so he kind of wanted to do all this research. And by the time he did, the hyperinflation had gotten worse, so he could no longer afford the carriage. He could just afford the horse. But he wasn't going to buy just any horse, you know. He needed to, you know, open up all their mouths, check their teeth, do all that, whatever you do before you buy a horse. And he waited too long, and he could no longer buy the horse. So he went ahead and just took the streetcar to the University of Vienna. This is a true story, right? It was horrible, the hyperinflation. And it's followed by the Great Depression in 1929. And um, the Great Depression spread worldwide and helped to fuel totalitarianism, fascism, in all kinds of places like Germany. And, you know, my parents who lived through the Depression, and some of you may have had parents who lived through Depression, will, will, you know the stories. I don't need to tell you the stories of all of that and the hardships. And so it leads to this very ugly <coughs> World War II, right, and the Holocaust and all of that. And still, people are trying between the wars, before World War II occurs, to escape Germany. And one of those was Theodore Dries. Any of you own a Dries home? Okay. Huh? You know the Dries? The Dries, I know them. They're a very nice family. Uh, Theodore Dries was born in Gorel, Hanover, Germany, in a small farm. He worked in a creamery. He immigrated first, most people don't know this, to Brazil. And he tried farming there with his brother, George. They were not successful farmers. They took up bricklaying. And then the brothers immigrated to the Cincinnati area in 1927, worked as laborers, built their first house, the Great Depression. George returned to Germany and married Elizabeth Feldman of Feldman Dairy. And as the Depression eased, they began building houses in what would later be Fort Bryan. 
So that's an example of a family that came over, the Dries family, between the wars. Now we're up to World War II. And we've got lots of heroes from this area of World War II of German descent, but we're only going to look at two of them because we don't have all night. One of them is lesser known, and his name was Reverend Henry Bernard Stober. He was a Catholic priest who volunteered as a chaplain in the U.S. Army. He was deployed in 1941 to the Philippine Islands, taken prisoner by the Japanese in April of 42, went through the Bataan Death March, where he met during that Bataan Death March uh, Dr. Alvin Pallay. He had prison work detail on the island of Mindanao, then was sent to a POW camp, and was on, bound on a hell ship to Japan. The hell ships were ships that they just loaded prisoners up to, and they were going to take them to Japan and have them work the factories and so forth. That was bombed, but he swam to safety. And then he was put aboard another ship, the Inora Maru, which was a Japanese ship, and then that was sunk, and he died aboard the Inora Maru, a hero of the World War II. And do some of you remember Dr. Alvin Pallet or heard stories of Dr. Alvin Pallet? Yep. Yep. MD from the University of Louisville. He was born in, he was from Newport, Kentucky. He joined the U.S. Army Reserves, went to the Philippines, and went through the Bataan Death March. He was a POW, and of uh, course, he went down, he had been a high school football player, but by the end of the war he was down to like 90 pounds dripping wet. So all the home front folks were all involved, all these German schools and these German public school students and Catholic school students. Why well, look at this boy and how much he raised in a scrap drive at Sacred Heart. This kid was patriotic. <laughs> 11 counties of northern Kentucky, there were 589 dead or missing from the Army, 126 dead or missing from the Navy. And then we come to post-World War II. George Crutchdans, born in Laura Conover to a, the Polavans, and 25 miles from a village of Theodore Dries. He immigrated to the U.S. in the 1930s, was in partnership with Theodore Dries, not Dress, sorry about that, in building homes in what became Fort Wright. After 1940, he built homes on his own in Fort Wright and elsewhere, sponsored the immigration of Matt Tobin, who is another builder, also of Laura, Germany, to the U.S. in 1953. Another person who worked for Kutschdans was Bill Krumpelman, another German builder. George Brothers Nick served in the German Army in North Africa and the Russian Front. He came to the U.S. after World War II and built homes in the Fort Henry subdivision of Fort Wright. Then he sponsored the immigration of things like my friend's father, Rudolf Polaven, to the U.S. in 1955. This shows some of the things Crutchdance was building in Lark Drive in Fort Wright in 1955. Then there was Matt Tobin, born in Lorik, Germany, studied woodworking in Borga, Germany, immigrated to U.S. in 1953. His sponsor was George Crutchdans, for whom he worked as a carpenter, and then he started his own Tobin Builders in 1955. So, how do we get back to more than beer, brats, and polka? In 1976, in time for the bicentennial of the United States, Alex Haley published a book called Roots, The Saga of an American Family, and it was made into a mini-series, and everybody was watching it. And everybody decided after that time that they were all going to hit the libraries and do their genealogy, and the libraries had to hurry up and beef up their genealogy collections, which they did, and people went wild, and before long, genealogy, that is looking up your family's history, became the number one hobby in the United States. I don't know if it's still there, but it became the number one hobby and held that position for quite a long time. It all of a sudden became okay again to be Italian-American or Polish-American or African-American or German-American even. And so shortly after that, they decided to capitalize on this and say, Let's put in Mainstrasse Village in Covington, opened in 1979. Let's have an Oktoberfest.
Fest, first year 1979, a May Fest 1980. By 1881, the Oktoberfest attracted a crowd of 150,000. And now we know Cincinnati's, you know, new, uh, and it's new, it's also this time period, it's Oktoberfest is the world's second largest Oktoberfest. So for all of you that haven't been around this area for a long time, it doesn't date back 100 years, only goes back to this time period. And so when they put it together, they did the commercial marketing thing in order to get the troops out. They brought back all of those things that they remembered, like Geta and beer and polka and later hosen. And now we're beginning to study again and bring to the forefront, thanks to all people who are doing historical research or belonging to historical societies like this one, we're learning to appreciate our own heritage and how it fits in to the American mosaic. And now you know from what you've learned tonight and what you can learn when you leave here is that the Germans in this area, we don't like to just be associated with beer and polka and brats. We're much more than our food and drink, right? We've got hearts and souls and literature and music and art. And I invite you all to look into all of those things and to read about them as well. Are there any questions? Wow, we're, we're like 50 minutes. That's good. I didn't want to talk too long. Yeah. How did Roebling wind up in this area? Oh, okay. Roebling is a fantastic story. I'm glad you named it because it's like I almost planted you there. Because <laughs> what are we? We're celebrating in 2017. We're celebrating the centennial of World War One. We're celebrating the 500 thing. You know, with with Luther. And we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of that bridge, which officially opened January 1, 2017, unofficially to pedestrians in December. So, how did he get here? Roebling went to uh, Berlin Polytechnic Institute. By the way, he studied under some wonderful philosophers and everybody else, but besides an engineering degree, he loved it all. At 25 years old, imagine this, at 25 years old, he said, I want to go to the United States, leave my family. His mother was heartbroken. I think she actually had a heart attack the day he left or the day after he left. Um, he led a group of colonists from his hometown at 25 years of age to uh, Pennsylvania, right outside Pennsylvania, where they had lost, uh, they had bought some land. He was a farmer, and then he was going along the Pennsylvania Canal, and because there are a lot of mountains in Pennsylvania along the canal, there was a point in time where you can't take a canal over a mountain, so you have to unload all of the people and the goods and put them on a uh, traction railway and bring them down, and then put them on you know, the, the canal boat over here again. And those things used to be uh, hauled, the cars were hauled up using hemp ropes. And he was there one time when the thing broke, the hemp rope broke, and two of the workers died in front of his face. Now he had nothing to do with any of that at that time. He was so moved that he said, I'm going back to my farm and I'm going to invent, because I went to this engineering school, I'm going to invent a wire rope that will be strong enough, but also by taking it and winding a bunch of little wire, wire ropes around would have the tensile strength, you know, it'll be, you can, you can roll it up on a reel. It took him a few years, he came up with a patent, he started manufacturing it, he started building wire, rope suspension bridges and then he got the offer to come to Cincinnati and work on the suspension bridge. I have, I want to come back if you'll have me in 2017 to talk about Roebling and to talk about that bridge and to talk about why if you were a good businessman you wouldn't have invested in that bridge at all. You had to be a forward-thinking, progressive 
innovative person like Amos Schinkel and everybody else to invent the net bridge. Because there, I, you, I could name you a hundred reasons why it was a bad investment. That's how progressive Cincinnati was, innovative, technologically, and everything else. I want to come back and tell that story. But it's a beautiful story because he leads colonists here for democracy, and then he sees two deaths, and he says, not again. His invention saved probably thousands of people, right? Thousands of people worldwide. And it was used for elevators. We wouldn't have elevators. You can't get an elevator on a hand pro for too long, you know. Anyone else? If not, thank you. Oh, John is holding up the book. They're $20, special price. I'll even autograph it for you to your loved ones, no extra charge. Um, I love being here at Boone County Historical Society. I used to live here in Boone County, love my time here, um, and I think you have a great society that you should be very proud of, and I'm always happy to come back. Thanks again.